Often in today's world, I think, we expect too little. We expect too little of us and too little from other people. Our expectations are far too low and below what we are capable of. Capable of doing, capable of thinking, capable of being. And so I want to raise the bar a little bit especially when it comes to what we're capable of in following Jesus Christ, of who we're capable of being in following Jesus Christ, becoming those faithful followers whom Jesus calls us to be. So I invite you to use that information, those thoughts, to let that set the context from what you are about to hear in our scripture lesson this morning. Our scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Luke. It's chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. And it describes some interactions Jesus has with three individuals as they are walking the road towards Jerusalem. So I invite you to follow along with me in your personal Bibles or in your bulletins. Hear these words. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, him being Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he, he is Jesus, said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as far for you... Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of God for the people of God, and God's people say, as you all do so faithfully each week, I invite you to pray for me in sharing this message as I pray for each of you in receiving it. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be good and right and joyful and acceptable in your sight, for you truly are, each and every day, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before I entered the ordained ministry, I spent several years as a youth pastor, a youth minister, at about three different churches. And at that time, this was a deep and profound calling in my life. I was honored and humbled and privileged to walk alongside of students, teenagers, as they began to figure out who they were and how faith and a relationship with Jesus Christ fit into the context of their lives. It was a wonderful time in my life. One of my favorite things to do with youth groups in the summertime was to take them white water rafting in North Carolina and Tennessee. Have any of you ever done that? Well... It's an exhilarating experience. It's good for teenagers, for students, because it is exhilarating without usually being too over-the-top frightening. They loved it. 
I remember my first time taking a group, and I'll admit before my friends and congregation here this morning that I am not the strongest swimmer in the world. I can swim. I really don't like for my head to go underwater at all, but I can swim. And so I was a bit apprehensive on my first whitewater rafting trip leading a group of about 25 teenagers and some other adult chaperones and the senior pastor of the church I was serving at the time he was there too I was a bit apprehensive but the senior pastor said Sarah don't worry it's basically just like a little lazy river once they put the helmet on you and the life jacket I mean, they're really not going to let any kids think about it they're not going to let any kids be in any sort of danger you'll be just fine and so we were driving the bus up the mountain to the place where they let you off to get on the rafts to go down the river you could see through the bus window that it did look like a little lazy river and I thought all right I got this it's going to be good and then as we stepped out of the bus and we're putting on the helmets and the life jackets and the paddles, something strange happened. Whoever was controlling the dam in the river opened it up. <laughs> Do you know what happens when the dam opens? Everything all of a sudden is white water. That lazy river disappears and there are white caps and everything. And I thought, oh no, what have I gotten myself into? But I can't step out of this now. There are these 25 kids looking at me. I'm going to have to do this anyway. I survived that trip, obviously. And it was fun, exhilarating, just a little scary. Had some risk to it. I do admit. And then the next year I took the kids back and we were at the same spot and we were with a guide in training. <laughs> the guide in training on the first rapid, which was not one of those really high class rapids, what does he do but fly out of the raft? down the river we had to pull the raft over to the side and put out a lifeline and him grab onto it and get in the boat <laughs> always that little bit of risk with whitewater rafting and you know what they always make you do those whitewater rafting companies before they even let you put that helmet on and that life jacket on what did they make you do sign the waiver sign the liability release and I remember reading that looking at it loss of limb possibility <laughs> thinking oh no now what have I gotten myself into and my favorite line in one of these companies I don't remember which company it was somewhere in Tennessee it said please be advised that death or other ailments can occur in the context of this activity. <laughs> death and other ailments, like what other ailment could there be besides death? <laughs> Always a risk with whitewater rafting. They're protecting themselves, the companies. They're protecting us but letting us know that even though we don't expect it or, or look for it necessarily, there's always a risk when you go whitewater rafting. And so this week I was reading this scripture, and I thought to myself, when we read these hard words of Jesus, these difficult words of Jesus in the context of these three particular episodes with these three particular individuals we read about today, that maybe we should, as Christians, when we profess our faith and become a part of the body of Christ, become a part of the church, that maybe we ought to sign a liability release waiver as well. Following Jesus is risky business. Following Jesus to the extent in which he calls us to follow him as Christians can be very dangerous. None of us really expect that when we become a Christian that illness could occur, that injuries could occur, that death could even occur. We don't walk into it expecting that, most of us. 
But yet, if we look at the course of human history over the last couple of thousands of years, we see that some folks who were truly committed followers of Jesus Christ, who lived the gospel in the way that they believed Jesus called them to live it, totally committed to him, that they experienced persecution, injury, maybe even death. Following Jesus is risky business. It can be dangerous. Following Jesus is a risky assignment. To become completely sold out to the good news of Jesus Christ can bring danger. Following Jesus is a risky assignment. So today's passage helps us with that. This passage is found at the point of Jesus' ministry when he turns his face towards Jerusalem for the final time. Jesus knows that within a matter of days or weeks that he is going to make it to Jerusalem and in Jerusalem he is going to be captured by his enemies and he is going to be killed. He knows that. And the people who meet him along that road, they don't know the full implications of Jesus' journey or lordship yet. But some of them know they want to follow this man. They want to follow where God is leading them in their lives. And they reach out to Jesus or have Jesus reach out to them. And Jesus tries to make it clear to them, just in these three very short episodes in this scripture that what following him will entail. What becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ could and would mean. And even though a couple of thousands of years have passed, these same words of Jesus, these same warnings of Jesus, can apply to our lives as well as we also seek to live out our lives as followers of Jesus Christ, as disciples of the good news, as we embark or continue on our journey of life and of faith. And so we turn to the three short episodes found in today's scripture. We're going to look at each of these episodes and find out for ourselves what they can mean for our lives today. As we struggle with our lives, as we struggle with making good choices, as we struggle with what it means to become a disciple of Jesus Christ in all of its risky nature. The first episode is one where we see a very eager would-be follower of Jesus Christ. To me, it reminds me of, you know, that kid in your elementary school class when the teacher asked a question, was always saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. It's kind of what this would-be follower was like. He says, Jesus, pick me. I will follow you anywhere you go. I am ready to do this. And he doesn't really know quite what he's saying. He doesn't really know quite what it means to become that risk-taking follower of Jesus Christ. So Jesus responds to him and says, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man, me, has no place to lay his head. What Jesus is saying to this man is that Sometimes it is uncomfortable to be me. It's uncomfortable to be the son of man. It's uncomfortable to be doing what I'm doing. And because of that, if you follow me, sometimes it is going to be uncomfortable for you as well. I think we as Christians have become way too comfortable. Especially in the United States, we have become way too comfortable with our faith. 
with what it means for us to be a follower of Jesus Christ. But yet, what Jesus is saying in this short episode with this would-be follower is that to truly follow him, sometimes we are going to be very uncomfortable. We're going to be called out of our comfort zones and we're going to be called to do things that make us very uncomfortable. We're going to face rejection. And rejection for us as humans, makes us uncomfortable. We're going to face rejection from family members, from friends, from people we don't even know because we have committed to follow Jesus Christ. Following Jesus Christ is risky. It's dangerous. We could face rejection. And it's surely going to make us uncomfortable. Jesus says, I'll be with you through it. I'll give you all the courage and strength and peace you need to get through it. But believe me, you're going to be uncomfortable. To follow me, you're going to be uncomfortable. And that's okay. Because a life of faith is an adventure. And we're called to go out boldly and courageously into that adventure. But believe me, while on the adventure, you're going to be uncomfortable. And in the second episode, we see Jesus reaching out to one of the would-be followers. We don't know if this man was looking longly at Jesus and and trying to figure out who he was or or what his mission was. But we do do know that Jesus reached out to him first. And his response to Jesus was, sure, but. How many times do we do that in our lives? Sure, I'll do that, but first let me do this. That's what the man in this episode says. And what the man asked Jesus to do, it's an honorable thing. It's a good thing. It's a humble thing. Sure, God, I will follow you. But first, let me go bury my father, and then I'll be ready to follow you. Probably everyone in this room would first want to go bury their parent or family member or friend and then go about their business. But Jesus' response is strikingly stunning. He says, let the dead bury their own dead. Your job is to go and proclaim the gospel. Those are hard words from Jesus. How can Jesus say that? What does Jesus mean by saying that? It just seems shocking, maybe even a bit out of character for Jesus. What does he mean in saying this to this man who says, yes, he will follow him, but first just let me go bury my dad. I think the point Jesus is trying to get across here is that we are in our lives are often faced with hard choices. Every day we struggle and are faced with hard choices. And a lot of the choices we face are not the choice of doing good or doing evil or the choice of doing something right or something immoral, but the choice of having two things that could both be good and honorable and seemingly right things, but can only do one of them. Only being able to choose one of those things. We wish and we want we could choose both, but we can't. In this episode, Jesus is telling this man that in life and in the journey of faith, there are hard choices to be made. And you have to choose the one that best sends forth the mission of God in the world. What choice glorifies God, brings praise to God, brings about God's kingdom little by little on this earth rather than advancing our own personal wants or agendas or missions. I think a phrase can help with this. It's missio dei which means the mission of God. 
the choices we face are do we want to advance the mission of God in this world? Are we going to choose to advance God's mission or instead advance our own mission? And it's hard. And we're going to struggle with it. Every day we are faced with hard choices. And Jesus says, Jesus calls us to always choose what glorifies God above what glorifies our own wants or desires. So in this passage, in this episode, Jesus says, just like it's uncomfortable to follow me, just like it's risky to follow me, just like it's dangerous to follow me, to follow me, you're also going to make some very difficult and hard choices along the way. And then lastly, we see the third episode. And in this episode, it's also a yes, but kind of response. There's a man. He wants to follow Jesus. He's walking with Jesus down the road. He sees Jesus. Obviously, he becomes caught up in the excitement of what Jesus is doing of the healings, of the miracles, and he wants to join in on this revolutionary turn the world upside down movement. And he says, Lord, I want to follow you. Let me go back home and say goodbye to my family first. And again, that's something I think everyone in this room can relate to. Before we start out on a big trip, we want to call or say goodbye to our family, especially a trip where we don't know if we're going to come home or not. It's natural for us to want to say goodbye to our family. And how does Jesus respond? Again, in kind of a, a shocking and stunning way, he says, for those who are plowing and turn their head to look back, there's no room in the kingdom of God for them. Again, how do we wrap our minds around that answer? What Jesus is saying here is to follow him, we need a laser-like focus. We have to keep our mind on our aim, our goal, to follow and be committed to Jesus and not let any distractions get in our way. Have any of you ever plowed before? I've done it a couple of times. Some hands are raised. When you're plowing, you have to go completely straight and look completely ahead, focused on the point in which you're going to end up. If you take your hand off the plow at any moment, if you let your eyes go in any direction, your row is going to go zigzag and you're never going to be able to plant the crop you need to plant, that's at its best. At its worst, you could have a big accident and be killed. It's essential to keep your eye straight ahead to the end goal when you're plowing. So Jesus uses this farming example because, thank you, he uses this farming example because it is a community and a culture that knows farming. And that's going to relate directly to the people. And so he tells the man, you know, if you look back, if you let yourself get distracted, your life is going to go all zigzag and you're not going to be able to focus and follow me the way I call you to focus and follow me. And that happens in our lives too. Distractions are everywhere. We get distracted by jobs, family, friends, entertainment, whatever. And if we allow ourselves to be distracted just for the slightest amount of time and take our eyes off the end goal, the prize in which Jesus calls us to be committed to, that heavenly prize, we're going to find out that our lives are going to unravel at the seams and we're going to go all zigzag as well. Last May, there was a collegiate college running championship. All the best male college athletes gathered in one spot to run all those different races. 
And there was one race where one athlete, he shot out from the beginning and he was far ahead and he was sure he was going to win. He kept running and as he approached the finish line, just for a split second, he turned his head to the side just for a split second, taking the focus off the finish line and raised his hand to get the attention of the crowd for their praise just for a second. You know what happened? Another runner shot past him and won the race. Now this man, he had been winning the entire race out ahead. But just taking his eyes off the finish line for just that split second to raise his hand for the crowd to clap for him caused him to lose the race. It can happen in our lives too. When we take our eyes off the finish line, off from what God is calling us to do and be, even for just a split second, if we let ourselves get distracted, we end up losing the race of not becoming the people God so desperately wants us to be. One of the things we get distracted so much by is that need for affirmation. And it's great to feel affirmed. We want the affirmation of friends and family and loved ones. But in the end, we must remember that the only affirmation that really matters is that affirmation from God, who loves us no matter what we've done in the past or what we will do in the future. Can't earn it. God loves us. That's where we must seek our affirmation. The Apostle Paul talked a lot about races in his letters. And in one he, he wrote this. He said, I want to leave the things of the past behind so I can press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us in Christ Jesus. And hear those words again with that racing metaphor. Paul says, I want to leave the things of the past behind so I can press on towards the goal to win the prize for which Jesus Christ has called us. We are children of God. Let's live into that, church. Today, let's be encouraged by that calling. Let's remember the words of the Apostle Paul. Press on. Do that, church. Do that, friends. Press on. Press on in your lives toward that heavenly calling which Christ has called you to do, to be, and to become. And may our faithfulness together as a church, as a community of faith, as a people, may our faithfulness together bring about change in this world so that a little more of the kingdom of heaven can be found on earth. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you so much thanks that you are a loving God, that you are good that you create, that you sustain, that you redeem. Be with us, God, as we learn what it is to live risky lives for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Following Jesus is risky. Following Jesus can be dangerous. Let's live like that. Let's not be afraid to be uncomfortable, to ask the hard questions, to have a laser-like focus on the end goal, the prize of the heavenly calling of Jesus Christ. Be with us, God. Be with us, your people, as we live out risky lives in your